Couch Talk. My name is Barbara G. And tonight I'm going to be interviewing a very special guest, a very talented young man. His name is Dr. Wayne Gilbert. He has played all over Europe. He's a professional musician, piano player, and an extraordinary singer. He's accompanied many, many singers, including me, over the years. And I'd like to interview him because today, or this week, he's going to be turning 50. And I'd like to know a little bit more about him. And I think you will too. I think you're going to enjoy meeting him. So why don't we get to meet Dr. Wayne Gilbert. Wayne, why don't you come in and sit down with me? Hi, sweetheart. Good Great to see you. Good Always. to see you, Don. Now tell me, first of all, tell me what it was like growing up. Where did you grow up and what it was like in your life, in your family? What kind of family life did you have? Well, I grew up in Roslyn, Long Island, which was a very rich town, and I didn't have money. My family didn't have money. It was more of a, I don't know, kind of an underdog situation. Most of the people were friendly with, in the cliques. So I guess I had to spend most of my time with my 88 friends, the piano keys, when I was growing up. Okay. Now I'm assuming, what, how, how old were you when you first started playing the piano? Well, um, there's video of me playing in 1969, which I guess I was about two years old at that point. Really? So. So that's, uh, Did you take you know, piano lessons? Did someone teach very, you? Very young, I took piano lessons, but I didn't stick with them because my piano teacher, although she was excellent at ear training, she wasn't a very, um, I was, she wasn't really good at performing. We'd have recitals and she would be all over the place. And I kind of started teaching her how to play certain things. And at that point... Wait, was, you were teaching her how to play? Certain things, yeah, at that point. And, and became, so you were a child prodigy, more or less? In a way. I would I would say lucky. I was lucky. You Did know. you read music? Did you learn how to I read music? I still don't read music. I still don't. No. It's it's completely by ear. And that's what I got out of my piano lessons. She would basically hold up things, cards, and, and uh, say, is this a fourth? Is this a fifth? And blah, blah, blah. And I'd have to do that. And, and that's how I basically learned everything. By ear? Mm -hmm. How interesting. Yeah. Fantastic. My mom told me, I never heard you learn a song. I, I didn't understand that. She goes, you just pretty much has always played them. I never heard you sit and learn a song. So I guess it's just kind of lucky. I, I don't have other great skills. I can't draw. I can't, uh, I can't dance. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do a lot of things, but this particular thing I'm pretty good at. But the piano is your instrument. Actually, I play every instrument. You play so, every instrument? Well, I'm not really good at the wind What do you play? Guitar. As a matter of fact, uh, I did all the guitar playing on a bunch of my own CDs. I did all that. Now, oh, I didn't I know, know that. I know. I'm, I'm not known for it. No. <laughs> but yeah, I'm great in the studio when I have 85 takes to take something, you know, to get it right. But live, I, I kind of leave that to my electronics now to simulate. Master people. of everything. You no, know, just not good at the wind instruments for some reason. I never caught on with those. But drums, one of my best instruments. Bass, yeah. guitar. Really. All the, all those. Yeah. Why don't you incorporate that when you play? Because now with my keyboard, I can have all the instruments oh, that's right. synthetic, yeah. and, and it's right. no longer a rinky dink. It's it's completely, yeah. I don't know. It's state of the art, better than CD quality sound on these things. The way they've recorded, they've actually recorded like saxophone, or whatever. They've recorded a couple of notes each one, mm -hmm. so it's basically a sample of a saxophone when playing, and people are fooled. <laughs> And by the way, you come from a show business family, I understand. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, if you've ever heard of the Jolly Green Giant, or if you've ever heard of Charlie the Tuna, or if you've ever heard of uh, Tevier from Fiddler on the Roof, you've probably heard of my cousin Herschel Bernardi, who was my uh, grandfather's first cousin. And he was a very sweet man. He died pretty young, actually. But um, so my grandfather. Always idolized him, and he so wanted to. He was Charlie the Tuna and the Jolly Dream Giant. The voice of, of no all kidding. these people, yeah. How wonderful! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's right. That is so cool. Yeah, it's I pretty love amazing. That. Pretty amazing. And he was very sweet to me the few times I got to meet him. Yeah. And my dad, of course, in show business. My dad was a radio talk show interviewer for oh. 18 years, and then he owned a radio station. He actually got to uh, interview Bob Marley. At, from what I understand, the very last interview Bob Marley ever did before he passed away. Your dad did that. Pretty amazing, yeah. So you get that talent. I got to meet dad. a lot of people. 
through his interviews. Okay, so where did you actually grow up? Okay, you grew up in Roslyn. Correct. Where did you go from there? Strangely enough, the bass player in my high school band moved to a town called Macon, Georgia, where the Allman Brothers and Little Richard were from. And he said, do you want to come live in Macon? And I laughed at him. But when he told me I could make enough in one night playing with this band, we're a really popular band, I could make enough to pay my rent and all my bills in just one night of play. Oh, well, it was 1992, so I guess, you know, five, oh, okay, 25, all right. Something like that. So yeah. what did you get in Macon? I mean, what kind well, of... Well, we're a very popular band, an extremely popular okay. band called Trunk Space. And uh, we lasted a, a couple of years until, um, you know, what happens to bands? <laughs> How just, long were you there? Five years. And it's not only, I didn't only do music in Macon, I actually opened a restaurant. Because living in New York when I, when I was growing up, you can't live on just being a musician. Well, most there. of them are waiters and waitresses, right? Correct. So I was actually a, more of a, like a chef working in different restaurants. I so you trade. can cook too? Yes, yes. I'm, that's one of my So what do you mean passions. you can't just, you have a lot of talent, All my right. darling. You got me there. You got me there. That's one other you thing see? I can do. Cook a lot better than I clean. Really? <laughs> okay. Yes, but I opened up a gourmet sandwich shop and I modeled it after the White House uh, sub shop that's in Atlantic City because I remember oh. that as a child as being my very favorite. It was amazing, that place, really? the White House sub-shop. So we went back there. My mom and I took a trip, and we kind of like, I think, slipped the guy 10 bucks to give us some secrets of his recipes, how thick you cut the cheese, what brand of cheese, blah, blah, blah. And we opened up this great sandwich shop. Oh, my so you did that with your mom? My, my brother with actually brother. followed me to Macon eventually. Okay. And then he actually, believe it or not, got a job on a TV show called Seventh Heaven on the WB network with, yeah, uh, yeah amazing. Doing was, what? Uh, in the production staff. Oh, okay. And so he moved out to LA, and I said, "Well, what am I going to sit here for?" So I sold the restaurant and moved on. Moved to That's Florida. Right. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. <clears throat> okay. And so, from Macon, you came to Florida, and then what? Well, what did I heard that you traveled in Europe though? When did that come? Yeah. About? Well, what happened was I got a job at Mars Music here when it was here, a music store. And I saw that there was an ad for Howl at the Moon, which is dueling pianos, which is a oh. big, big, big thing. And I learned, that's where I learned to be, you know, comical and more of an entertainer and come out of my shell. And um, I got an offer to move to a town called Schevenhagen in Holland. <laughs> and I couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist it. I went and I, and I moved to Holland and that played out for a while and then... Uh, Something went a little sour there, and one of the other piano players told me I should contact this agent. And this agent just sent me to about a dozen different countries to perform, one month at a time, which was amazing, because I could taste all the foods and get to learn languages and really get culture. It's not like a one night here, one night there. It was a month in, in you know, Germany, Norway, what a is, month in, huh? yeah, it was, it was amazing. Like Switzerland, Austria, I'd just go on. It was, it was quite a time in my life. It got lonely after a while making friends, because I'm kind of friendly, and then you make friends, and then you leave after a month, and you may never see them again, or contact What a great friends. education. Oh my God, yeah. Fantastic. Food is to get about. Oh, uh -huh. my, with my passion, my passion, you know. Food is your passion. Food and science, and my real... Tell me about that. Science? Yeah. I've, I've always wondered why more people are not fixated on how everything works. They just kind of accept it, that it, that it works, you know? But um, it's so intricate, it's never ending about how, how the universe works. And it just fascinates me over and over again. I, can, I sit in my, in my free time, I sit and I watch the Science Channel, learning about astronomy. And but are you technical? Technical machine-wise? Uh -huh. Yeah, actually, um, there's, there's this level, beginning, there's mediocre, there's a little above mediocre, and then there's amazing. I'm kind of above mediocre up there. But didn't you help design your piano board? As, as a matter of fact, one of my greatest accomplishments is when I was working at Mars Music, uh, the Yamaha representative came in with this keyboard and it had like five buttons on it. And I said, why only five buttons? And he said, well, because people get intimidated when they see a lot of buttons. I said, but, but if you want to transpose something in the middle of a song, you got to go 
Menu. Da 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 da. Global. Yes. Enter. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Up five. Yes. Blah blah. And went on and on and on. And I said, wait a second. You know what? Why are buttons going to be intimidating if you if you sell it right? You see a button that says piano. Oh, there you go. You press it and you have a piano sound. You want to transpose? Oh, a transpose key. Bing, 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 bing. I said, I can sell these things. That was my other forte. I was a good salesman. But I came up with the design and pages uh, for what eventually came out to be a prequel to the keyboard I have now. And I said, also, why can't with all these technologies of harmonies come out, why can't you put a microphone right into your keyboard and use a harmonies from what you're playing? And... Uh, they basically stole my idea. Oh. But yeah, that was that was not fun. That was not fun. But I did win three awards from Yamaha for my okay. uh, for my salesmanship at different that's at different true. times. So that's a little booby prize, I guess. But, so uh, you must have met some very interesting people in those years that you traveled and you've been. How long have you been in show business, more or less? Well, I was in a high school band. I guess it got me started, but I was always. Yeah, like I said, you can't make a living, so I was cooking, and I was working in music stores, I was doing all kinds of things. I, I started working in an organ store, trying to integrate new technology into these organs now, because they weren't using pipes anymore, they were using electronics. And I got into that for a little while, and uh, that was pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Wonderful. So who did you meet in your travels, uh, talent-wise? I mean, famous people, celebrities, who have you come across? Funny enough, most of all the celebrities I've met have been <laughs> uncanny amount. And this is one of the craziest parts of my story. I've met them in the United States. I don't okay. even recall meeting anybody over in Europe in all those times. But, you know, my idol has been Todd Rundgren. And my father, of course, being the radio talk show host, was able to hook me up with a lot of people. And then I had another friend who was in the travel industry who used to work at the VIP sections in, uh, you know, in the John F. Kennedy Airport, and he used to like help them out. So they would help them out, and I found myself backstage with Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, backstage with you know Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, Deep Purple, and it goes on and on and on. And I got to play with you know a, a bunch of people too. I guess um, Richie Cannata was amazing. He was a uh, saxophone player from. Billy Joel's band, and I got to play with Liberty DeVito, who was the drummer from Billy Joel's band, along with Pat Travers, the famous guitarist. He's, he's amazing. And, uh, and then I got, when I was playing at the Hard Rock, I got the chance to play with Billy Joel's full band without Billy, unfortunately. So I got so to So you were the some, piano player while Billy you know, was One of away. the two, yes. One of the, okay. one of the two at, at the time. I have, oh my God, Rick Wakeman from Yes. I got to have dinner with him and, and he, he's an idol of mine. Uh, I could just go on and on, but there, there's been crazy who, people. Who's, and then, who influenced you? I mean, not, who was your, yeah, who influenced you? Do, was, is there any one musician or any one person? Well, my father was your dad? very much into the, the Broadway thing when I was growing up. Okay. So I had to learn, you know, all the Pippin songs and the Annie songs. And then, but I don't know, something about Sticks when they came out with Come Sail Away. That piano yeah. it was so nice, so I started getting more interested. And then when I joined uh, Failsafe, the band, my high school band, they were introducing me to songs by a band called Rush. And Rush is a Canadian band that has the most technically hard, impossible stuff to play. So I think that helped me a lot to... to you like to a play. challenge. I was, I was happy to be able to meet the ch I don't know that I like challenge. Yeah. You know, I, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily just come out with that as a uh, as a thing that I would say I don't have challenge. I, I like to be able to. Well, you're a perfectionist. That's for sure. In a way, yeah, that gets me in in trouble. Yeah. You know, analytical. You know. Ah. Yeah, the Virgo analytical thing. You know, I guess through relationships. Why do you always gotta analyze everything? Why do you guys always analyze everything? <laughs> oh, so that's the trait of the Virgo. I guess it Analytical. is. Analytical. Okay. I guess it is. And cheekbones. They say cheek high cheekbones. Really? I don't know. Not <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna take a break right now and then we're gonna be back with Wayne, Dr. Wayne, which I wanna get into why they call you Dr. Wayne. So uh, I will see you back in three minutes. Don't go away.
Okay, so we're back with Dr. Wayne. Okay, tell me how you got that name, Dr. Wayne. <laughs> Strange story, but absolutely true. When I was working in, it's called Pizza Pub in Roslyn, I used to come in and everyone was upset they had all this work to do, but I was always like a good mood kind of person. And I would always like, you know, cheer people up, say funny things. And one of the guys who owned the restaurant, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always making people feel better around you. You're like a doctor. We're going to call you Dr. Wayne. We're going to call you Dr. Wayne. <laughs> so they started calling me Dr. Wayne. Nobody else called me Dr. Wayne for many years until I was in Macon and trunk space had broken up and I decided I was going to start playing solo again. And what happened was I just didn't like the Wayne Gilbert Project. It just didn't, that's the name I was using. I, so I came up with different names like Wayne Storm. Like, it's kind of stupid, but it, I actually named the CD that, and, and then uh, a few other things, and I passed it out to a bunch of people who used to come to see me play, and Dr. Wayne was amongst the names. Unanimous. Unanimous. No, Dr. Wayne, you are Dr. Wayne, the musical healer. Plus, Todd Rundgren had that album, Healing, which was my favorite of all time. So I had the, the medical symbol on it, the Kedusha thing, and I decided to kind of borrow it as, a, as my symbol, and, uh, and that's... What? I like that. Musical healer. The musical healer. That's musical even better. Yeah. So, okay, so what was it like in your high school years? Were you very popular? I mean, being that you were so musical, were you in the band you in would, high school? You would have hoped it, right? <laughs> but on paper, I was popular. In reality, not so much. Really? I was unanimously elected senator. Of my, it was a, called SW at the school within a school section. I guess they had different senators for different sections of the school or groups or whatever. I was the president of the audiovisual club. Okay. And uh, so I got you know to learn about some of the technical equipment there. So I was I had status. I was also believe it or not teaching piano to students. While I was in high school, I was giving classes, and I also taught a course called the History of Comedy. So, uh, did you status-wise, did you I want to be a comic? Is that another little I, thing that you? You know what I wanted to be? A me. judge. <laughs> Why? I always wanted, thought I was going to grow up and be a judge until I realized I had to, you know, learn <laughs> something. <laughs> right. And when I and when that didn't work out, um, I. Uh, I thought, yeah, comedy, maybe, because I'm more of an impressionist. I do impressions. Do you? Yeah. Can you do an impression for us? Oh, I guess uh, Rodney Dangerfield is, the, okay. is my big one. But give me a subject to talk about with him. His wife. Hey, my wife, you're kidding me? Oh, she can't cook at all. She made me toast and had bones, you know. <laughs> my, yeah, I like that. So, That's very good. Yeah, I love it. I love you really look like him. I, I thought about going out as a Rodney Wangerfield, <laughs> but I never came off the ground. And I also thought about making a movie about him because uh, he was amazing. I got to meet him too. Yeah. And what, what another interesting story. I uh, basically snuck into a show at Westbury Music Fair in New York. Snuck in a tape recorder. After the show was raining out, my friend and I waited outside the back door to hopefully get a glimpse of him, maybe. Meet him. It was raining out, so there was no one there except one other guy. I see somebody look out, I guess it was his manager, and he said, uh, Mr. Dangerfield would like to invite you in to say hello. Would you like that? I'm, of course. That's what we're waiting for. So I, I go in and I, and I said, hey, Rodney, pleasure to meet you. And he said, hi, nice to meet you too. I'm like, who the, who, who is that? That's not a <laughs> guy. He was just like the most relaxed person. He resembled nothing of that crazy guy. But I was still, you know, thinking, what am I going to say to Rodney Dangerfield when I'm in? I told him, Rodney, your show was worth every penny. We snuck in. <laughs> and he said, oh, funny, funny, funny. I said, by the way, do you have any great, great, great granddaughters you might want to set me up with? Anyway, he appreciated it. And that was fun. So Rodney has been, I always thought he was just one of the very best and funniest, moodiest. So. It's, it's, such it's a comedy, but when I did the Howl at the Moon thing and the dueling pianos, it's it's like you have to learn comedy because it's a lot of comedy, a lot of profanity, but a lot of a lot of comedy. You know, mm -hmm. ripping, doing roasts, yeah, bringing brides up and you know, right. and bringing guys up and singing. You know, he's always a woman for me or whatever it is. You know, so I had to do a lot of comedy. Now it always seems to come out in, 
in my shows somehow. Okay, now you're going to be 50 years old. That's half your life is over. Duh, more. <laughs> more than half. <laughs> I assume. Okay. Well, now that people are assume, being, yeah. living longer now, they're living to 100 years old easily. It could happen. Oh, for sure. So what have you learned in your 50 years? If you look back, what is the biggest lesson you can learn about people, about life? It's, it's amazing that we are all in the same place. We all came from the same place. I personally believe we're all going to the same place, because that makes sense, you know, progression. But even though we're all in the same place, we all see it completely differently. You have the Republican point of view, the Democrat point of view, this point of view, that point of view. We all digest what we see around us in a completely different way. And we all feel we're exactly right and the other people are exactly wrong. And I've only recently had to accept that, that live and let live and not try to change everybody to my point of view all the time because that does nothing but create animosity, even though I know I'm right. <laughs> there you go. Why don't you just agree to disagree? Agree to disagree. It's hard. It's extremely difficult. Extremely difficult to agree to disagree. Because something seems so obvious. Discrimination. Come on! I didn't ask to be born white. I didn't ask to be born whatever I am. I could have just as easily been born anything else. I could have been born a cockroach. I didn't ask for it. So why am I going to discriminate against somebody else because of what the universe decided to make them? It, it drives me crazy. It just That's one thing I cannot stand is discrimination and hate. I just don't get it. Although, when I was younger, I was stupid and naive just like a lot of people. It just took a while. You said, what have I learned? That's what I've learned. I didn't always know that, I guess. If you had to change something about yourself, what would it be? Mm, well, I have changed a lot. Well, I know you've lost a lot of weight. I've struggled with weight. Yeah. Um, Tell us about that. You know, I was the skinniest thing growing up. Skinny, skinny, skinny. I mean, skinny all the way. And I used to, you know, kind of say, I would never let myself get fat. Next thing I know, I'm 300 pounds. And my family is tormenting me. And anyone who cared about me was tormenting me. And, um... I decided at one point that's... You know, Why do you think you put the weight on? My passion for food is, is, you know, like Rodney Dangerfield said, oh, you're kidding, in my house, food has replaced sex completely. I even put a mirror over my kitchen table. <laughs> you know, it, food is my big, big passion. And the more of it you get, the more it was like, But you're also filling a hole, you know that. Yeah, obviously. It's an addiction. It was. It was. I, I actually am proud of, very proud of being, although I probably don't get the credit or you see me once in a while sneaking an ice cream sandwich or whatever, I really have cut down on my sugar intake and portions. So and what are you eating now that's different than you ate before that you could maintain A lot of yogurt. Because that's the hard thing to do yeah, to maintain. A lot of fruit, a lot of yogurt, a lot of um, smaller portions, really. I was using those Slim Fast kind of shakes for a while and I did very well with them because they curbed my appetite for a while. I'm very good with those. And uh, now I'm hoping to just stick to it, because I check my weight often, and I check my blood sugar here and there, and uh, I don't want to, you know, get back there. I can't do that to myself ever again. Diabetes runs in your family, is that right? All of us. Yeah. My so father, so my brother, and me. Yeah. Uh, they have it worse than I did, but still, not good. Not good in many levels. Well, it's a good thing that you're starting it now, that you have a nice, long, good life ahead of you. You know, it's funny. Um, we've lost, I've lost people who have spent all their lives eating healthy, all their lives drinking tea, and they've died young. And then you look at George Burns with his cigars, and you just got to wonder. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if it has anything to do with it. It might have all been written long, long ago, but... But I know that uh, it's nice to be able to tie my shoes if I have laces. <laughs> it's nice to be able to, you know, look down and know I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> that you can see your private parts. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a little bit, because for a while there I couldn't. I know. I, I had know. to get past my four chins and then forget about it. If I got past them, I'd still with the stomach. 
so that didn't work out. Well, I hope you have another good 50 years well, ahead of you. Thank you so much. And it was a joy and a delight to thank meet you, so, you so and talk with you Absolutely. and speak with you. Are you Lots kidding me? Luck. The legendary Barbara G? Hey, thank you, Don. Are you kidding? Thank All you. you've done with it. I really appreciate you. Asking My pleasure. Me. My pleasure. And a happy, happy birthday, sweetheart. Well, thank you very and much. One more for the books. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that ends another wonderful evening with Barbara G. Uh, this is called Couch Talk. And I look forward to interviewing another charming uh, guest next week, another musician or whoever comes our way. And stay tuned. Please come back and visit us. Good night now.